Alabama Public TV presents Spotlight on Agriculture. Hello, I'm Steve Leith, president of Auburn University. Welcome to the third episode in a documentary series on agriculture, produced and hosted by Alabama Public Television. As the world grows at lightning speed, never before has the role of the farmer been more important. Everyone must eat. But unfortunately, feeding every person is not as simple as growing more food. Our environment is changing, and our natural resources are becoming limited. This means we must rethink the way many foods are grown while innovating new methods and new techniques. Sustainable practices in agriculture are key. Overcoming challenges such as drought and disease are crucial. These are the goals our agricultural scientists at Auburn are meeting every day. For the next hour, you'll see how they are increasing both yield and nutritional value for the peanut industry. You'll learn about their innovations in fruit and vegetable production through sustainable hydroponic and aquaponic systems. And you'll go behind the scenes of a couple of Alabama's well-known and lesser known specialty crops. From Auburn and Alabama Public Television, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the program. Auburn University has been engaged in peanut research for many years in a variety of different fields or formats. Currently, we're very excited about our, our work related to peanut breeding, but we have long done work related to peanut pests, insect pests, weed pests, and, and fungal or plant diseases that affect peanuts. We are also very active in looking at uh, peanut fertility issues as well. So we're, all aspects of peanut production we've been involved in. When you think about Alabama, here in the southeast, our climate, our environment, our soils, we're well positioned to be a major uh, row crop producer. And so we produce corn, wheat, soybean, and peanut. And Alabama's number two in peanut production in the U.S. So we have a substantial stake in peanut production. Peanut is a high protein crop, so it's imperative that we continue a breeding and genetics program to improve not only just the yield of the crop or the disease resistance, but also the food quality aspect of the peanut crop as well, such as its oil content, protein content, the vitamins that are in, in peanut. Those are all important issues and important parameters within a peanut breeding program. We started the program in 2012 when I was hired in the Auburn University as a peanut breeder. So the basic idea is like I say, you through the hybridization to combining the two desirable traits from the parent, both parent, like a male parent, female parent. And then you go through the whole process we call the selection the pedigree selection. So that means we select the, in the generation for the best plant of the peanut and until that plant becoming the becoming a pure line. And then we're doing the evaluation like for the yield trial, disease resistant evaluation, also in the lab doing some chemical analysis. So finally we go to release the new variety. In terms of the drought tolerance, or we call the water use efficiency, that's a big challenge in order for, the, for the, our country, but also for the world. So for example, like I say, the, our uh, Alabama state, especially down to the south here, agriculture area, every year we have uh, less and less available agriculture irrigation water. So that's the idea come out, uh, how we're going to save the water. So the one of the solution, I believe, is to develop the variety has a high water use efficiency. We have been working on the project for many years, trying to develop a variety 
with the drought tolerance. Dr. Chen's new cultivar, AUNPL17, is going to have a tremendous impact. When you think about the yield potential it has being compared the last few years against the standards that are out there now, the uh, high lake oil quality trait that it possesses, which allows uh, better oil stability, which allows longer shelf life. That means for helping feed the world, you've got, you can make peanut products out of a peanut that has that longer shelf life. So I think that in another year or two, when we see it more widely adopted, because we're just in the early stages of seed increase right now, and the demand already just in year one has been much greater than we can provide. So as the next year or two moves along and we see seed increase get to the point where any producer that wants to grow it, we will certainly be able to uh, see it planted widely across the southeast and there's also going to be demand from an international market at some point. So we're very proud of Dr. Chen and the advancements he's made in peanut breeding and genetics. He has a, a wealth of experience. He's extremely well respected across not only the country but across the world for his expertise. And his approach on uh, peanut advancement as far as genetics are concerned is very novel. Well, he's looking at it from a number of different areas. Uh, one that he's particularly looking at is in drought tolerance. That's very difficult within any row crop or agronomic crop because you're trying to manipulate that plant to produce the same or more on less water. So you've got a lot of physiology involved, you've got the genetics itself involved, the management that's involved. So the reason why drought tolerance is so important in his breeding program is because there's a lot of areas in the world, and even here in the southeast, where irrigation's not possible or water's not plentiful enough. So if you can develop a plant through genetics that has the capability of being more water use efficient, then you greatly increase the potential for yield and quality advancements. Auburn's Research and Extension Program works very, very closely with the Alabama Peanut Growers Association to make sure that we're not only breeding peanuts that meet the needs of, of our society as far as being uh, healthy and nutritious, but also are high producing so that they can realize a profit. We also help them with their cultural management of tillage, planting, weed control, and all those things. So we make sure that when peanuts are growing in Alabama, they're not only profitable for our farmers, but they're good for our resources. I've been farming on my own ever since I got out of school in 1976. So I've got a few crops. Peanut industry in Alabama has expanded to a lot more counties and yield per acre is gone up drastically. That's the only way farmers are able to stay in business. Almost all of our peanuts go for peanut butter and the candy and snack markets. Oh, peanuts are now grown in 37 counties in Alabama and it is a big deal. It's, it's lots of hundreds of millions of dollars. Peanut farmers in Alabama are always fighting diseases, fungal diseases, nematodes in the soils, and just various diseases, and we constantly are relying on getting new varieties to, to help us combat these diseases. Auburn's Ag School has been able to keep research for us to help us stay ahead of these diseases and nematodes, and we now have a peanut breeding program in Auburn that is hopefully going to give us higher yields and higher grades on our peanut crop. When I was a kid, a really good production was a ton to the acre. And then it went a ton to half to the acre. And then it went to two tons to the acre. And now good production is considered two and a half to three tons to the acre. 
So our production per acre has gone up greatly. That's the only way we're able to survive in the economic times. We're more productive because we have better varieties, we have better fungicides, we have better nematicides, and we have better research to tell us when and what to do at a certain time. So then you go to cut. Yeah. And the body, and you cut that you and do the sequencing, right? So here. We have a new peanut variety coming out of Auburn, and growers are really excited about it. The yield and the grade looks really good on that. It will give more pounds to the acre, meaning more that the grower can sell, and it's really high quality. So those two things contribute to the grower's bottom line. You know, over the last few years, we've seen some expansion uh, further north in Alabama. Uh, historically, the peanuts have always been grown, you know, from the Troy, Mobile area south. Um, but over the last few years, we've seen expansion, you know, as far north as even um, uh, Blunt County, you know, even north of Birmingham. And not a lot of growth up there, but still it's exciting to, to see the industry grow, um, you know, see those guys try something different, um, you know, hopefully add another crop to their rotation, make them more profitable. Um, but, you know, again, when you, when you come to the south part of the state, I mean, peanuts have always been uh, you know, a big part of the ag industry in general and, and still today, it, it still is. Um, you know, as far as jobs, uh, Peanut contributed a little over uh, 2,000 jobs to the state of Alabama. We currently have a processing facility uh, in Troy uh, where they make peanut butter. So, you know, we have aspects from uh, shelling plants to obviously the growers um, as well as manufacturing. So we're, we're excited that we now have that part of the industry in the state. Auburn University has always had a good relationship with peanut farmers in Alabama. They've been doing peanut research for a long time. Um, you know, traditionally going from, you know, diseases, um, weed research, uh, insects, any particular type of pest that we have, they're constantly out there looking at, you know, new, new products that are on the market, testing them. Um, again, building those relationships with the growers, letting them know what, what's working, what's not working. Um, of course, you know, irrigation, uh, that's the thing that we're continually uh, seeing grow here in Alabama. More and more farmers are, are putting in irrigation and in Auburn, they're, they're doing some, uh, some leading edge research, you know, looking at ways to not just irrigate, but irrigate more efficiently. Um, and that, that goes back to, to peanuts, you know, in a, really in a good way. I mean, peanut is a, um, it's a, it's a pretty uh, drought tolerant plant anyway, um, so we don't have to put a lot of water on it, um, but again, Having that ability and, and to do it effectively, um, it, it makes the, the grower more profitable at the end of the day. Uh, of course, you know, we're excited about the new variety that uh, Dr. Chen's gonna release, the AUNPL 17. Um, we, we've seen through the years, you know, a, a peanut that's developed in Alabama versus one that's developed in East Georgia. Um, it may perform well in East Georgia and be a flop here in Alabama. So having one that has, has been tested and developed in Headland, in Alabama, Hopefully that's gonna give our growers uh, a little bit more of a competitive advantage, um, you know, moving forward. I hope their legacy is gonna be the, the new seed program we have. Um, Dr. Chen, he, he's an outstanding breeder, um, and, and that's not something I'm just saying. You, you talk to people who are who are in the breeding industry and, and they'll all tell you he is a top-notch guy, really knows his stuff. And, you know, again, having, having varieties that are developed here in Alabama, um, again, I mean, our, you know, you cross the river, get into Georgia, I mean, the environmental conditions are just so different and, and peanuts are, um, they're very sensitive to that. So, you know, I think long-term, um, I mean, getting out and talking to growers now, they're excited that we have a variety coming out of Auburn. So. You know, as we move forward and, and Dr. Chen continues to develop, to develop that program, um, I really think long term that that's going to be probably one of the biggest impacts in terms of the, uh, the College of Ag at Auburn and, and peanuts in Alabama uh, is what he can bring to the table. And when you look at peanuts in the United States, we're really considered a minor crop. There's only about 1.3 to 1.5 million acres planted in any one year, and you compare that to corn and soybeans in any one year to about 80 to 90 million acres. So it is a minor crop US-wide, 
But here in the southeast, it is a major crop. The states of Georgia, Alabama, the Florida Panhandle, and South Mississippi account for about 75% of the total U.S. production. And we're right in the heart of that area. So our, not only just the southern half of our state, our coastal plain soils, but we're seeing peanut production expand up into northeast, northwest, Alabama, the Tennessee Valley, anywhere there's sandy soils, we have producers looking to take advantage of our climate, our soils, and produce peanuts. It's a huge economic driver, especially when you get in the southeast and southwest Alabama. The uh, infrastructure that's involved from your peanut buying points, the peanut shelling facilities, and the manufacturers that are here in the state, they employ a wealth of individuals individuals that are an important cog in the peanut production process. So we really do look at it here in the state of Alabama as far as peanut production as being from, from when the seed are planted by the producer and harvested all the way through the other processes to a final product that is delivered to the consumer. Producers bring the peanuts by and we've uh, we go through a process here where we, what we want to do is get a nice profile. We pull the peanuts off the vines and we'll take a, a, a pressure washer. We'll actually blast the outer coat off the peanut. And when you do that, you're going to see that some of these peanuts, as you can see the progression of how they get darker as they get more mature. And so that gives us a first a kind of a, a nice look here. And then we're going to get a little more specific. And what we're trying to do is give them an estimate, the producer an estimate of how many days away from digging we are. Because we call this putting them on the board. And we can from, from this and some experience over, over years of looking at them. We also know by talking to the producer about how many, what variety this is. That helps us too because we've determined that certain varieties we know about how many days. What we don't know is what kind of environmental conditions they were under, were they irrigated, were they dry land, all those factors have a lot to do with it. And so what we try to do is gather as much information as we can, what kind of shape are the vines in, those kind of things. They've got 3,000 acres to dig, they can't dig them all at once, and so we're giving them uh, a little bit of a heads up on where we think these are compared to what he's got. This is our second sample, we'll look at three or four samples and he'll make decisions on what field he needs to go into first. We shell these out and we put them on the board. By doing that, we get a nice look on the inside, we get a nice look at what's going on, and we also are able to see what's behind us. This is, uh, not only do we have these peanuts that are being, that are pretty mature, we have anything from the orange coming all the way to the white. So what percentages do we have? And if we took our time, we could divide these up into different uh, sections and we get a good look. But again, based on a lot of, a lot of experience and doing this a lot, plus the information we can get from the producer, we can make a pretty quick decision. Within the next 10 or 15, 10 minutes or so, we can usually run a sample from the time we start. And we can give him a, uh, and so he jots down on his little book there. He says, okay, this is yeah. gonna be, this is gonna be, uh, the last one we looked at was five to seven days away. This one looks like it's three to five to me. Uh, and so what, what he's got to do is look at what, what do I have, how many peanuts do I have that need digging? What about the weather? Is it about to rain? You know, would it, would, is there a storm coming? I might get in here and dig these. They're going to be better above ground than they are in the ground if they're mature because if they stay in the ground past maturity, this is when we start to lose them. So what we're trying to do is dig them on time. And then when he, when he digs these peanuts, when he picks these peanuts, they're going to be graded. And the grade is just like being in school. The, the higher the grade, the, the better it is, and the more they get paid. And so we want this, we want this peanut to grade as best it can so that he gets a maximum uh, amount of money for his, for his crop. So there's a little bit of science and a little bit of art, a little bit of experience goes into all this. This technique really works well to get us a nice, nice look on the board, so to speak. If there's a young person that really doesn't know what they might think they want to do, I can tell you that trying to help feed the world is going to be paramount in the next 20 to 30 years. We need more people in the, in the areas of science and processing and food crops are going to be an important way of providing protein to individuals worldwide because we've got this problem of such a dramatic increase in world population just in the next 20 or 30 years. There's tremendous opportunities out there for individuals that just don't really want to know what they want to do when they get to college. But I can tell you the agricultural sciences, 
in the food sciences are wide open areas that are going to continue to have great job opportunities in the future. One area of research and teaching that I'm excited about is our work related to aquaponics where we're integrating vegetable production with uh, fish production in a uh, contained system. Hydroponics and aquaponics are both methods of growing plants without soil. The difference is that in hydroponics we use inorganic fertilizers to, to provide plant nutrients. In aquaponics, we use fish effluent, so fish manure in water. We remove the solids and use the liquid fraction. And they, in, in both of these cases, we get plant nutrients in the water without soil at all to the plants. The nice thing about aquaponics is that you can be growing two crops at once. You can be growing fish in the tank, taking that water, recycling that water, letting the plants in the greenhouse extract those nutrients, in other words, clean up the water, and then we get vegetables in one crop, we get fish as the other crop. The other thing that's neat about that is we don't have to do that on a farm setting. We can do that in an abandoned warehouse. All we need is water, electricity, and well-trained people. So they can have the tanks in the, in the location, grow the fish, have the greenhouses outside to grow the vegetables, and we can be marketing aquaponic fish and vegetables throughout this state. That is a way of feeding nine billion people in the future. So in this system, this is called an aquaponic system, and what we're doing is co-culturing an aquatic species, in this case Nile tilapia, with a high value greenhouse vegetable. And so what we're doing is feeding the tilapia a high protein diet. The tilapia are then consuming that high protein and the waste product is being converted into useful nitrogen that the plants can use. And then we use that nitrogen to fertilize plants. And so what this does is it gives us two uses for the water. Uh, one, we use the water to produce the fish. And then two, we use the water to produce high value vegetables. And so this is a step towards more water conservation, which will of course be more important and also uh, nutrient conservation. So all of our inputs should be maximized in this system. Hydroponic farming works without any soil whatsoever and typically it's done in a, con a controlled environment. So in greenhouses uh, we would provide nutrients to the plants, we provide water to the plants, and the, wa and the nutrients of course are dissolved in the water. Uh, we have no soil whatsoever and we can control those nutrients because we can mix them ourselves. There are a lot of advantages to hydroponic farming. I would say one of the main advantages is the yield that you get per area. So on, typically we get 10 to 15 times the yield of vegetables in the same area that we would get in an open field situation. Uh, partly that's because of the controlled environment. Another part is that we can go vertically. So we don't have to have think in two dimensions. We can think in three dimensions uh, in a greenhouse situation. Uh, another advantage is that we can um, harvest locally, so we can put these different operations in very small areas. They can be put in an urban setting, in a semi-urban setting, or e even in a rural setting, but we can harvest, uh, let's say, a tomato and have it to the user the same day, which is not, not typical in a, in a field operation. Another advantage is uh, the reduction in water usage. So, uh, a typical amount of water that could be reduced would be about 90%. So, so we use about 10% of the water we would use in a field situation. I think that um, if you're interested in environmentally sustainable farming and, and kind of the future of farming, then greenhouses are, are part of that. Um, being able to grow plants in a controlled environment certainly offers us a lot of benefits and a lot of those are environmental in nature. So we can reduce pesticide usage, we reduce water usage um, tremendously and what we, what we see is that we use a lot of biological controls, so a lot of uh, beneficial insects uh, that can be used in these controlled environments. 
In Alabama right now, we have a very small greenhouse vegetable industry. You might even call it a baby industry. Uh, but if you really look at the numbers, we have tremendous potential here. So um, we eat about 11 to 12 pounds of lettuce per person per year that could be grown in greenhouses. So that's excluding iceberg lettuce. So if you think about that as per person, we could grow all the lettuce requirements for Alabama, excluding iceberg lettuce, on about 250 acres, which is a very small footprint, right? And we would reduce our water usage by maybe 90% in that, in that area. So environmentally speaking, uh, if you can get over the, the construction cost and the energy cost, that's what we're trying to work on to, to reduce. Uh, the, the future's bright here in Alabama. We uh, grow mainly tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, um, some microgreens for the local market, strictly local. Everything that we produce uh, is sold within a 50 mile radius of us, so a little bit more than 50 miles into, into Montgomery as well. And uh, we sell to local restaurants and also to the Auburn University. We actually moved here from Atlanta and uh, looking for opportunities to get out of the corporate industry and uh, interested in growing hydroponics my entire life. So uh, opted to start out small over here, at least a piece of land, started that and then eventually moved on to purchasing this location. Hydroponic farming is uh, growing plants and, and vegetables in a, um, in a, either in just in water or in the perlite, non-soil uh, basis, uh, basis and uh, we manage the environment that it grows in. We also manage the uh, nutrients that we can provide it and uh, thus be able to grow products outside of the regular time frame of the season. For example, tomatoes, we'll have tomatoes in December and uh, complete them in July. So. so I can produce it locally and, and harvest it today and deliver today or harvest today and deliver tomorrow. That's a big aspect, the freshness of that product. We get that feedback from the restaurants all the time. Our product will last with them for a week, two weeks, three weeks, if it's taken care of properly. Um, the nutrient factor, um, I think, you know, being that we can manage the nutrients and the environment that the product grows in, we're able to grow a uh, more premium product than what you would out in the field. Auburn has helped me uh, tremendously in making this a success through the advice that they gave me and suggestions that they've made. It's definitely very helpful anytime I get a disease or I get any questions as it relates to nutrients and so forth. I can take leaf samples right down the street to them. I can take water samples right down the street to them and get pretty fast turnaround. Also, if I get stumped on something or need additional uh, advice, they will. I can call them and they come out there and come take a look at what I've got and uh, give me pretty quick feedback on it. At Auburn University, we're using our aquaponic system, or one of our aquaponic production system, to provide fruits and vegetables and also tilapia to campus dining. And so this gives students the opportunity to enjoy very fresh uh, fish and uh, vegetable products uh, through the campus dining services. Well, I'm the director for campus dining, so we make sure that everybody gets fed. That's our primary responsibility. Uh, I work with a, a dining services contractor who is Chartwells, and uh, each day we serve quite a few students, and we have uh, 32 different venues all over campus. Well, the science of food for us, I mean, first of all, agriculture is a core pillar of Auburn University. I think it's one of the things that makes us who we are. We're a land-grant university, and so we really wanted to have an, an ability to feature products that are created here on campus. There's, a, there's been this trend towards local, and we have this opportunity to be even hyper-local. We can grow things right here and give students experiences with foods that they can't normally get, I mean, that we can bring things to, to bear that are fresher, um, that have a lot of thought behind them. We are absolutely very respectful of, of all the local farmers that we work with, but all the people that taught them work here. So we're really trying to optimize food in so many different ways and by doing that I think we can give students an experience that's second to none. I think one of the interesting things about the aquaponics project is that we're creating a total model. So from production, you know, you have the fish, the fish are feeding the plants. Um, we have multiple greenhouses that we're going to fully utilize the water in. 
but I, I think also we're, we're, we have plans to have uh, a trailer out there where we can actually do the fish processing. So that would allow a farmer to look at, okay, so I, I grow the fish, I grow the vegetables, and then maybe rather than selling whole fish, I'm going to be able to fillet those fish and sell it at a higher price to a restaurant or something like that. So it really gives, the, rounds out the model, gives people an opportunity to see it as a cohesive unit. It also, it, we, we feel like it could have an impact on food security because I think if you take that same system, you put it into a place uh, that maybe is a food desert where you could meal plan around the idea of having a lean source of protein, the things that you can grow in the greenhouse. And so it's another way that that system can be utilized. This type of job requires a unique skill set. We, we demand a student uh, have a, uh, an understanding of controlled environments. Okay, and so that takes into account the structural aspect of the greenhouses and also plant nutrition, plant growing uh, conditions and cultural practices and and also technology. So what we're trying to do is get students to understand uh, that there's a lot of technology available and the technology can really help us uh, manipulate the environment and actually produce a better product. As a state, Alabama agriculture is very diversified. We produce a large number of different types of crops. We're, of course, in the major uh, row crops, but we also are heavily engaged in specialty crops, such as peaches, pecans, or even a nationally recognized cucumber producer as well. I actually feel there's a lot of opportunity for growth in specialty crop enterprises in Alabama. You know, we've often argued about uh, water scarcities in the western part of the region as an opportunity for the southeast to expand its production of fruit and vegetable crops. But I also think just as important, the consumer demands we face today for local uh, food products will, will be an important factor in encouraging the growth of specialty crops in Alabama. Auburn University researchers uh, focus on, on research in this area. We are of course doing active research related to production systems. We're doing research related to all the pests and diseases that affect these types of crops. And we're also developing new varieties uh, that are adapted to this region. One very good example I would point to is the development of a kiwi fruit industry here in Alabama which is, uh, the, I believe, the first Kiwi Ranch uh, east of the Mississippi. I spent two years specifically focused on kiwi fruit, and kiwi fruit is a small world, I learned. And uh, I met some colleagues that were in the industry in New Zealand. And so when I finished that degree, it seemed only logical to approach them and say, well, is there a job offer, something I can do that I could show up for? And I, I approached the only person I knew, which was a grower in New Zealand. He was based there and I said, uh, what can I do? He said, well, just get on a plane, come on out with a wife and child in tow. Uh, we'll get you a one year visa and uh, it'll be at least a learning experience for you. They stuck with me and I ended up working for those guys for five years. And that was the beginning of my industry training. And through that period, I learned a tremendous amount from the contractors, the existing labor, and just the whole environment of New Zealand kiwi fruit industry, which is a very um, friendly environment. We're all working together in New Zealand as a single desk commodity producer. And so one guy across the road is not my com competition. The only competition is for bragging rights because we're effectively going to the same market under the same brand. And so there's this real serendipitous sort of sharing of information. And the possibilities in kiwi fruit in Alabama, they really are, um, they're exceptional. If this is successful, and it's gonna take a lot of figuring out to make it perfect, but if we can be successful here, there's a unique situation in the world market where supply and demand is just out of balance. You've got a Southern hemisphere supply, such as New Zealand and Chile, that are supplying a high demand Asian market six months of the year. And then the remaining six months of the year, that market is left looking for a product that it's no longer there. And you have to put it all into context because in the Northern Hemisphere, there's already a few fruit growing, kiwi fruit growing regions. You have Italy, China, um, parts of Japan and South Korea, and the United States. 
However, all of those fruit growing regions are plagued with a bacteria called PSA, which makes it extremely difficult to commercially produce your product. So now all of a sudden you have a market that's screaming out for a product, and you have a lack of places in the world that are PSA free, and the commodity will grow to a high standard. And that's why Alabama is so unique. We're PSA free, we have the weather that's appropriate, and thanks to Auburn University, we have a variety that's been tested proven and is now being commercialized here in the state. Uh, it's uh, two to one, the fruit to leaf ratio. Which number is two, which number is one? Uh, we want two leaves for every fruit. It's not agriculture. Agriculture is a intensive management of large acreage with the purpose of producing a crop on a 90 day sort of rotation. This is horticulture. This is the intensive management for a high value commodity. It's not selling agriculture short, it's just different. I need, within this industry, a whole lot of smart people. They, they have to be pest smart. They have to be irrigation smart. They have to understand the plant, the physiology, the nutrition, the potential to size the fruit, and then you get into the actual marketing of the fruit. This stuff will store for six months. So we've got post-harvest, cool store chain, logistics, how is the fruit gonna arrive in this overseas port? All of this stuff requires smart people who have gone through a university program and have pursued a career specific to this industry. Well, gold kiwi fruit is a brand new crop pretty much for the U.S., but definitely for the Southeast. And so um, we've been trying to learn best management practices and the best way that we can make that a profitable enterprise. For kiwi fruit, they're, they're di a dioecious plant, which means that there's male and female plants essentially. And so for them to, to produce fruit, you have a female plant that's going to you know, need to be pollinated by the male plant in order to produce fruit. And so with that research, you have to have a male plant that blooms at the same time as a, as a female plant and have that good bloom overlap and a good partnership to create good fruit. So a lot of research has been evaluating cultivars, evaluating the bloom periods, doing things to increase the fruit size, and we've been really impressed with their production. And, and um, kiwi fruit's native to China, and it actually has a similar um, climate to where we are, and so it seems like something that we can do quite well uh, in the southeast. And the hope is that, I mean, we're really excited about this, this enterprise here, and, and it is a pretty large commercial production that's focused on the export market. The hope is that this will be a proof of concept and others will get excited about kiwi fruit. And, um, and I, there's, there's lots of regions of Alabama that we think are suitable for kiwi fruit production and the Southeast. All of those things are being brought right here to central Alabama. And although it's at a small scale, I like to think that we are bringing new careers that haven't been available historically, and we're bringing them right here to, to the central part of the state. Our extension agents and our extension specialists have field days and educational meetings where people come to our, our extension facilities and learn what's going on on contemporary research and help them. But in addition, our website. People now are so busy, it's hard for them all to get the meetings. They want to be able to find out that information quickly at their own time. And so we're expanding and enhancing our website so that they can get that information for adults and youth. multi-level organic and conventional vegetable crop research. Uh, most of the crops we deal with are open field crops because as you can realize, insect pests are the most, are most active in open field. So we have the conventional track uh, where we test a lot of insecticides, conventional insecticides, and we do a lot of consulting with the large producers. And then we have the organic uh, track which deals with a lot of small farms, 
We also have a large number of beginning farmers. Uh, many of them are military veterans. And we teach about organic production systems and pest management. And some of it also goes on to high tunnel crops and greenhouse crops because they tend to be more organic than open field. We reach about 1,000 clientele around uh, the state every year. So there's a large number and it's an increasing number of people coming in. And when they call um, and we give the recommendations and answers to their questions, there's almost 90% adoption rate for those recommendations and also people coming to the workshops. So we have done assessments through our extension surveys. We have found out about $1.8 to $2 million of direct impact with our program. And it's only guessing how much indirect impact we're having. But it's a, a big the return to the state uh, with the funding and to the to USDA through the national grants grant programs is about 36 to 104 dollars for every dollar invested. So we give a big return in in the terms of uh, good food quality and quantity across Alabama with the program. We take the research information that's developed and uh, evaluated on the station here around us and our stations around the state. We'll take that information, uh, put it into publications, and also get it out to growers in meetings, so in production meetings, whether it's our peach production meeting or our strawberry production meeting. Uh, basically try to get the new cutting edge information out to growers. The old way would be primarily through face-to-face -face meetings. And we answer a lot of phone calls, emails, texts, but now more and more we do that electronically. So we'll have electronic meetings. Uh, so even if we have a production meeting, but we'll also broadcast that as a webinar that they can log into. And so we do more and more like that. Throughout the state, we have a wide variety of fruits and vegetables that are grown here on the station and in Chilton County, of course, peaches are king and have been for a long time. Uh, we produce a lot of peaches here and do a lot of peach research, looking at varieties, looking at pest resistance, things like that. But in addition to peaches throughout the state, uh, strawberries are very popular, blackberries are very popular among our growers and our clientele. Uh, Blueberries, certainly, uh, apples, pears. Uh, we have some newer or, or more uh, ethnic fruits like Asian pears, Asian or Oriental persimmons that are a wonderful fruit. And we like to work with these and, um, and get information out to folks about how they can grow these better. One of the primary needs growers have is for good varieties, um, varieties that are better than what they've had in the past. And so you ask somebody uh, what's their favorite peach variety and a typical person is going to say, I want an Alberta. They go to the market, they ask for an Alberta peach. Well, that, that was a great peach in its day. And we have lots of great peaches that have been bred from and developed from Albertas. Now though, we have resistance to various diseases like bacterial spot um, and other qualities that would allow for larger, better quality fruit, uh, fewer diseases in that fruit. So, so here at the station, at a time, one time we probably had 400 different varieties of peaches and nectarines being grown in the variety trial here. Uh, and today, that is one of the primary things that our growers want. They want to know what are the newest, best varieties that they can use. My mentor was Marvin Durbin. He was one of the pioneers in the fruit production in this county. And then, of course, working with a lot of the extension agents and Auburn University was a big asset in the beginning. We had uh, Cash Howell as our county agent, um, Dr. Arley Powell, who's still in the county here and retired here. He was a great mentor also. So we constantly had a research station down the road and others that contributed to what we, we do. Through the years, we've relied on them, not only varieties that we plant, there's numerous, numerous varieties of fruit. And uh, we like to grow a tree ripened fruit that will hold up well and sell direct to our customers. So we use practices that uh, we notice out here, we've got pruning on the ground. We summer prune in the head of our 
harvesting it allows more sunlight and a sweeter fruit and uh, just leaving the fruit on the tree another day or two adds a tremendous amount of sugar. So that's, that's what we specialize in, growing the sweet, uh, good fruit. We actually have about 15 varieties of peaches and about uh, six or seven of apples. And uh, peaches, uh, most varieties, it, it takes years and years to develop that variety. A lot of varieties here are named after a fellow named Prince, and they're like Gold Prince, and June Prince, July Prince, a lot of varieties that takes years and years to develop that variety. So, uh, and then we have some of the old favorite varieties like Loring and Harvester, and some just great tasting fruit. We're very fortunate, not only our county agents here, but our specialists, our fruit specialists, and we have Gary Gray and Edgar Vinson, both of those are here, and all we have to do is pick up the phone and call them. Our research station is right next door. We can go down at any time, whether it's the use of uh, spray material or, or varieties. If we want to see a new variety they may have on test, then we, we just go down and check with them. So, you know, my background was Auburn. I got my degree from there. So we've uh, constantly utilized people from Auburn University. And um, so it's been a blessing to us. My role is to help to make, uh, help growers to make uh, their production operations more sustainable. That is, uh, helping them to do, helping them to be as productive for as long as they can, um, while also being environmentally and economically sound. Uh, a variety that does well in one location may not do well in our location. So it, uh, it's important to have a track record of how well those varieties perform in our area before a grower uh, reaches it and plants it, only to discover that it does not fit their operation. We like to incorporate non-traditional crops or crops that have not been grown that show some promise that could uh, take off in, in production. Uh, one is called the honeyberry uh, fruit. Uh, that's uh, it's a, a fruit that's related to the honeysuckle. It looks like a black a blueberry. Uh, looks like an elongated blueberry, um, and it, sh it has some promise for our area. Auburn has uh, left a huge footprint uh, in the farming industry. Uh, some things that come to mind are just the development of, of uh, genetic development of certain crops, varieties uh, that are more productive, more uniform, uh, have a, a higher quality, and that are better adapted for our region. Uh, we've had, had uh, crops that from peaches uh, to, to peas to uh, watermelon, uh, and even kiwi. Uh, there, uh, Auburn has had a hand in the development of a kiwi variety uh, that is being, uh, being tested here at the station. Um, and that just really scratches the surface. Uh, Auburn has really done quite a bit for the, uh, the, uh, the farming industry in our state. I didn't grow up on the farm. Um, I was in my 20s when I first came into the business, but it becomes part of who you are. We, we live here on the farm. Um, we, we don't even drive our vehicles to work. We ride our gators um, through the woods, and, it's just, and our kids, our young kids, have grown up on the farm, and so we have a, a, a real interest in keeping the farm. We're trying to run a lean, tight, uh, profitable operation so that we can bring in others into the operation as our family grows and, and have an opportunity for them to be able to make a living. I focus my efforts on peaches since this is the most economical fruit crop for the state of Alabama. But also, I'm looking at some um, other group, uh, fru uh, fruit crops. Uh, for example, um, blueberries and blackberries. And um, uh, we're having experimental work going on with some apples and uh, Asian pears, European pears. 
We're looking at traditional grapes like muscadines, but also um, I started research with American, French American hybrid bunch grapes and uh, each crop has its own uh, problems or uh, constraints that we need to solve and all the research experiments that are uh, put in place here at the Chiltern Research and Extension Center, they're targeting to solve some of those problems. So uh, we're looking at um, new technologies, we're looking at new cultivars, we're looking at different new crops, new opportunities for our industry. And we hope that as a whole, um, when we uh, come up with a new technology for our growers, it is targeted to improve their returns. It is targeted to improve the sustainability, economical, social, environmental sustainability. It is targeted to improve the lives, quality of lives of our farmers and also the entire local communities. Jimmy Durbin's grandfather planted his first peach tree in the 1940s. So when Jimmy came back from World War II, he took up the peach operation and has grown peaches ever since. The season starts off with a smaller peach. Um, they are called a uh, cling peach, which means when you cut the peach open, the seed clings to the inside of the peach. Um, in July, we get into some of our more sweeter varieties, uh, cling-free peach, which will break away from the seed real easy, and a lot of people like to use those for canning purposes. Um, they, the peaches range in sweetness from mildly sweet to really, really juicy and extra sweet. So it just depends on what you like as to what kind of a peach you want to, to buy. The local market for agriculture is very important. Um, people are looking for things that are grown close to home. Um, a lot of your major suppliers, uh, grocery stores, want to put in products that are grown close to home. Um, uh, I don't want to eat something that was grown a thousand miles away and shipped in, took two weeks to get here, you know, and then it's trying to be sold to me in the stores. I don't want that. I want something that's locally grown, and so agriculture continues to be a big part in the state of Alabama. And everybody needs to support their local farms because that's the only way it's going to continue to grow. There's, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, a lot of exciting opportunities uh, on the horizon um, in our industry, and we're already seeing it. Uh, there is a, a renewed interest in uh, uh, the, the consumption of fruit crop, fruit and vegetable crops that are locally grown. All over the world, we're seeing that interest in, in people uh, uh, being more uh, involved in the production of their, their, their food, being more knowledgeable of the food that they're eating. That places uh, the science of horticulture and um, directly in line with that. And uh, horticulture then, um, over the years, will grow um, in that interest. They will have a, a place at the table when it comes to uh, uh, setting a policy and um, um, uh, direction of research um, to make uh, uh, the production of uh, fruit crops. Uh, more accessible to more people. The farming industry all the way around has changed. It has. I mean, your big farmers are starting to play out and it's your smaller farmers coming in, uh, more or less doing the retail side, trying to get the retail price, get the retail money, and making sure you have a good core contact with the local growers that are willing to do the job to, to have the best. That's the key. I mean. When I, when I get from my local farmers, if, it, if it's not top quality, I don't touch it. And they know that when it comes here, it's got to be the best. And once you build that relationship and that core, you've got something. And it takes time to build that. It does. It's not something that you do just overnight. It's something that you have to work at. And you have to be honest and pay the price for it. You know, so they can make money, everybody can make, everybody can make a good living. What I'm saying is that for the younger generation, if they're smart, it ain't about the big farm, it's about the small farm. It's about growing different things, and it gets people interested in buying, and, and it's fresh, it's good. 
but you just gotta be smart at doing it. You know, grow enough to take care of what little markets you run. Don't take as many acreage, five to 10 acres, and you can do so much. It doesn't take a thousand. So it's working with what you got. I'm excited about the future for agriculture in Alabama and across the United States. And we're in a time period where we're going to have to think about new production systems. Uh, some agriculture will be moving indoors and it just creates new opportunities for research and new opportunities for education. So if you're looking for new ways to, to really make a difference in the world, I think we have a place for you here in the College of Agriculture.